thanks very much for having us here. It's, it's quite exciting to be back at CES um, to, again, show the community some of the latest developments. Uh, my name's Graham Moffat. I'm with Muse. I think we can safely say that we are now the world's best-selling consumer neurotechnology. I think that's true. Um, certainly among them, in any case. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we uh, often um, remind ourselves is that we ended up in this place by accident. So our company was trying to create a way to control machines um, through thought alone. And that journey led us to question the ways that our brains interact with technology and how our brains can change through technology and what that means for mental health and for our very freedom of thought. So let's dive into a simple question. Um, do we as a technology community design for human technology interactions that improve people's lives? I think we all believe we do. Um, I think we believe we do but it's not necessarily borne out by the science. So in fact, one, just one example is uh, mobile technology and, and apps and their influence on mental health. Uh, here's the result of a large scale study of daily time spent in app for users who were measured as happy or unhappy in demeanor. And in every case except Google Maps, which has something to do with going outside and getting out of your head, uh, more time spent in app corresponded to less happiness. So how we design apps and technology to maximize engagement is almost certainly in conflict in many respects with mental health. And this goes deeper than just um, happiness and unhappiness. So our brains are highly plastic. Uh, and this phenomenon of neuroplasticity means that technology is changing our brains whether we agree to let it change them or not. So there are profound implications here for what it means to be free. Not, and we're only just beginning to dig into really um, what this means for cognitive liberty the freedom to have and control our own thoughts. So how we prioritize cognitive liberty will define, I think, define the future of our society. And this isn't just about technology. We individually can choose to change and control our own thoughts. So this is what we discovered by accident with Muse. Uh, we discovered in trying to control our brainwaves to control technology, that first we had to learn to control our own thoughts. So we, in a sense, turned technology back on, its, on the mind as a tool to increase our mental agility and our self-control. So, and we weren't the first to do this. So this, is, um, this didn't surprise anyone, I think, that Buddhist monks and other religions had been practicing these same techniques of mental and cognitive control that we had discovered by accident for thousands of years. So we learned that neuroscientists had only in the last few decades really um, tried to understand the practice of meditation through brain technology, through brain imaging technologies. And what they learned was that the brains of meditators were unique. Um, they had different oscillatory patterns, so they had um, more high-frequency oscillations. Oscillations are re representative of long-distance communication between different parts of the brain. And that the way information was processed was different from the rest of us. These changes weren't just transient. They, after a while, the brains of these meditators became anatomically different from um, non-meditators. So these brains look to science like the brains of younger people than the chronological age of the people uh, whose brains they are. And expert meditators have been crucial to understanding our consciousness and cognition and cognitive control. So the way we has been, have been studying brains has been changed not just by special people like meditators, it's also been changed by technology's availability to study brains in more natural environments. So you can take a meditator, you can put them in a laboratory, you get this kind of result. But what happens when you take brain research tools out of the laboratory into natural environments? So we can take these tools out. Um, and brainwaves, when you take them out, brainwaves are one of the easiest ways to take these tools out of the brainwave measurement, out of the laboratory, with something like Muse. Um, when, they, when you record and plot them, they look kind of just like this. So there's not a lot you can see in a brainwave, in a raw brainwave. Um, but if we do some interesting things, some cognitive tasks, so if I, that's what they look like when you're recording them. If I ask you to count, if I flash that dot and I ask you to count what, that number of times that dot appears while I record your brain waves, um, and then we know from neuroscience, from lots and lots of research that's been gone on for the last 70 or 80 years in neuroscience and in, in brainwave research, where in the brain that dot activates things. It activates certain things in the visual system, paying attention requires certain resources, um, counting requires certain resources, so we know where this, where this happens. And what's really cool is that if we synchronize the onset of the dot to the brain waves, we get characteristic waveforms. We know where each of these peaks happens in the brain. And this is a, a information processing in the brain. Uh, even cooler than that is that some of these things are sensitive to fatigue, some of them are sensitive to impairment, and others aren't. So this gives us some powerful measurement tools for interpreting and understanding the brain outside of the laboratory and even bringing that to 
consumers, to individuals in their personal lives and to help improve their mental health, their brain health, and their performance. So we can study oscillations. We can study how the networks of the brain communicate with one another. We can look at these event-related potentials, um, responses to specific events in the environment. We can even dig into the haystack of all of the spontaneous brain waves that are happening when you do things like sleep, and we can pull out specific events that correspond to memory consolidation while you sleep, how well, your memory, how well you're going to remember the next day the things that you experienced the previous day. We can look for population differences, how the brain changes with age, how it changes, how it's different between males and females, and how special populations differ from the rest of us. We can even measure neuroplasticity in individuals, so how well you're learning a skill, what's changing when you learn a skill. And we can predict, we can do really cool things. So if we look at you today versus yourself, you know, best and worst, um, this, has, this is now something we can do on mobile technology alone. So these are apps for iOS and Android uh, being launched here at CES by some of our partners at Aspire who are linked to the, tied to the University of Victoria where a lot of this research um, has happened. This has pretty significant implications, not just um, for consumers, but for high-performance athletes, for um, doctors who are making life-or-death decisions. We can measure now um, whether or not someone is a, in a kind of state of mind to be in high cognitive performance or whether they should really be, maybe be taking a nap before they try to go on shift for, in an ER or go in and perform a surgery. Uh, we can predict whether or not a baseball player is, going to, is likely to hit or miss on a swing based on their brainwaves immediately prior to. And you can take this just about anywhere now in your personal life. Um, you, can take these, you can take these apps into uh, daily practice and daily understanding of your routines and your brain health. Uh, and you can even do things like, um, and this is really cool, we, we, think, we tend to think of technology as sort of trickling, in some respects trickling from very high tech down to the consumer level. But sometimes consumer technology finds its way back to places like NASA where technology usually comes from. Um, this is the NASA Mars habitat in Hawaii where Muse technology and Aspire through the University of Victoria is being used to assess astronauts' cognitive performance through brain, direct brain health measurements on a daily basis <clears throat> in simulation for the Mars mission. But something that I've neglected to mention is that um, there's an important link that we've, uh, we've sort of glossed over here. Uh, one of, and that link is... When you, go, when you walk through uh, the, the exhibit hall in digital health, you're looking at individual organ systems. We measure the brain, some measure the heart, others measure the skin or respiration. Uh, but the links between these things are not accidental. There's, there's an important mind-body connection, and the axis that connects these things is the autonomic nervous system. So the vagus nerve, um, which meanders through the entire torso and touches the heart, the respiratory system, the digestive system has extremely important implications for the mind-body connection, how our physiology influences our brain function and vice versa. And to talk a little bit more about that and what we're doing now at Muse with the mind-body connection, I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend, Chris Amini. Thanks, Graham. So uh, we designed the Muse to support meditation practice. And it helps you by giving you direct feedback about what's happening inside of you, your mind while you meditate. And it works really, really well at this. But the mind-body connection offers so many more opportunities to help us connect the physical and the brain aspect of mental health together. There's so much more that we can do. So <clears throat> our mission with Muse is really, really simple. It is to help people help themselves with their brain health. And we do this because our minds trip us up. We have negative thought cycles, craving, addiction. We develop reactive mental um, behavioral patterns that we can't get out of. And with Muse, we focus on meditation because it has a profound effect on these things. But when we think mental health, we always focus up here. But we're not disembodied heads. We are embodied beings. And there's this super highway of connectivity that connects our brains and our bodies. And there are so many factors that we know of that affect our mental health. Sleep is a huge one, exercise, even the food that we eat. So I think we need to take a much more holistic approach to our mental wellness. And this really could be the next frontier of neuroscience for health. I think we'll see a lot more research and technology that honors this as we collectively try to understand and figure out how we can 
improve our brain health together. So one thing I found really interesting, and this comes from when we were first developing Muse and we were studying the, um, the long history of the study of meditators. Um, and one thing that really stood out to me is when they went to go and study long-term meditation practitioners up in the Himalayas and they were to work with these monks, the scientists put electrodes on the, the heads of these practitioners and they were met with laughter because all of these people knew that the self is in here, in the heart, not up here. And so I think that this, is, this has really stuck with me and we've really taken this to heart and this uh, is evident in the new device that we just launched that connects both the heart and the brain together in a collective measurement. And it's, it's, it's something that I think that we really need to explore together. There is a relationship between the heartfelt emotions that we feel in our hearts. When we think of the heart, we think of compassion, we think of love, we think of connection with others. And so there's something going on here that we haven't yet understood. And there are definitely some links that we know of. So we know that heart rate variability is affected by emotion. We know that uh, between people in relationship, the hearts synchronize in really interesting ways, and this happens between couples, in sports teams, musicians, uh, even people who are collected together having experience like watching a movie together. So there's a link that, that brings us together. It happens through the beating of our heart. So <clears throat> if we look at meditation more deeply, even though it's called mindfulness, it's actually an embodied practice. And it's not, by embodied we don't mean like physical exercise, it's about really going inside and sensing how we're feeling inside of our bodies. What it feels like to be you. So scientists have a, a, a word for this, they call it interoceptive awareness. So if we look at the practices of meditation, we see that there are actually many different techniques that are desi designed specifically to help us tune and develop this interoceptive ability. And what happens is as you grow a keener sensation of what's happening inside your body, you start to understand how you work. And when it comes to understanding how we can work with ourselves to regulate how we feel, our energy, we can bring a much greater wisdom to this because we have that deeper understanding of how we're functioning inside. So Muse 2, 2 for the two minds, but uh, we're actually bringing more than just the, the mind and the heart together. We're actually looking at the breath uh, and also uh, how our body moves. And so then as we practice meditation, we can really start to look at holistically how do all these components work together to empower our practice. So that's what it looks like. It's almost the same. Don't break something that already works really well. And we've just added some critical new sensing uh, capabilities that allow us to do these new things. Um, but I, one thing I wanted to stress is meditation is something, like anything else, to learn it effectively, it's really important to get feedback. So I like to make the example of riding a bicycle. If you were to learn to ride a bicycle and you, uh, by reading a book and then trying to practice without ever knowing if you were falling off, learning would be really tough and meditation is no different. And so this is really what Muse is all about. So the first Muse was all about the mind. So it gives you feedback on, on how your mind is fluctuating as you practice your meditation. So you try to focus your attention. And if your mind is busy and your attention wanders, you hear stormy weather. And as your mind starts to calm down, you're able to train that attention. You'll find the weather calms down and becomes peaceful. So Muse 2 adds the body, the heart, and the breath feedback. And really, this helps us build a foundation. It's such an important thing to do because as we try to calm our minds down, what's happening in our bodies really has a huge impact on that. So helping to build that foundation practice is really where Muse 2 shines. So something I'm really excited about as we um, bring this out and people are using it is we're going to learn a lot of things. There, really isn't a device that I know of that's so accessible that really measures so many things in a practice which is all about the mind-body connection. So something, we'll see what happens, but I'm pretty hopeful it's going to advance our understanding about how all these systems work together. And hopefully this can really help us in our mission to help people help themselves. So we have some really exciting things coming up. 
this year, uh, the first thing that you're going to see is a fusion between Muse and Meditation Studio. So if you don't know what Meditation Studio is, it's a fantastic app with amazing teachers and guided meditations. So through this, you're going to have complete courses uh, to teach you various things uh, in the meditation discipline, practices for sleep, stress, performance, parenting. And one thing we'll be bringing in is something we're calling adaptive guidance. Now, this is super cool. Uh, it's like having your own personal meditation teacher because when you're meditating, if you were with a, an actual person, they'd be able to craft their guidance to really suit how you're feeling in that moment. So if they can see that you're really in the flow, you wouldn't interrupt someone. So this is what the adaptive guidance really aims to do because we measure so many things about what's happening in your practice. We can see if you're starting to drift off to sleep. And if that happens, we can help you lift up your posture, take some deep breaths, and really bring more energy into your body. So the last thing I'm going to leave you with uh, is totally awesome. Um, we are launching a new form factor uh, for Muse at the end of the year. And this is a soft fabric device. So it's comfortable when you're lying down in bed. And so sleep is really the big story for us here. But it actually goes way beyond that. So if you're interested, come and find us. Uh, we've got a lot to say about it. And uh, that's what I have for you. Thank you very much.